In the previous chapter, we studied the beginning of Paul's first preaching tour. He and Barnabas traveled from Antioch to Cyprus and then to Antioch of Pisidia. In this chapter, he's going to continue this trip and preach in a few other cities before returning to the church in Antioch that originally sent him and Barnabas. We start reading in verse 1 of chapter 14. In Iconium they entered the synagogue of the Jews together and spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed both of Jews and of Greeks. But the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. Therefore they spent a long time there speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord, who was testifying to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided and some sided with the Jews, and some with the apostles. And when an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to mistreat and to stone them, they became aware of it and fled to the cities of Lyconia, Lystra, and Derbe, and the surrounding region. And there they continued to preach the gospel. So after Paul and Barnabas shook the dust off of their feet in protest against the people of Antioch of Pisidia, they traveled southeast to Iconium, as we read in Acts 13 and verse 51 in the previous lesson. And as they did in Antioch, they began their teaching efforts in the synagogue. The result here was that a large number of people believed, both of Jews and of Greeks. However, also like what happened in Antioch, the Jews caused trouble for them. While some of the Jews believed, the ones who disbelieved worked to stir up the Gentiles, yet Paul and Barnabas continued to preach there. In fact, Luke indicated that they were there for a long time, despite the opposition that was against them. They were able to speak out with boldness because they were relying upon the Lord. And Luke specifically mentioned the fact that the Lord was enabling them to perform signs and wonders, which was done in order to confirm the message they were preaching. It mentions this in Mark 16 and verse 20 when Jesus gave the great commission to his apostles. And the Hebrew writer also mentioned this in Hebrews 2 verses 3 and 4 when he talked about how the word was confirmed by the Lord as he testified with signs and wonders and miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit as the word was being preached. So after Paul and Barnabas had been preaching for some time here in Iconium, the city became divided. Some of the people believed Paul's message and sided with them. Yet others were influenced by the Jews to reject his teaching. In fact, they even planned to mistreat and stone Paul and Barnabas. However, Paul and Barnabas became aware of their plan and fled the city. However, we should not think of this as an act of cowardice. Paul's actions in the next city that we'll study here in just a minute will make it clear that he was no coward. Instead, this was like the disciples who were scattered from Jerusalem when Saul began persecuting the church at the beginning of Acts chapter 8. They were not fleeing out of fear, but leaving in order to not allow their opportunity to keep serving the Lord and spreading the gospel to be taken away from them. So, Paul and Barnabas left Iconium and traveled south to Lystra and then to Derbe. And as the disciples who were scattered from Jerusalem went about preaching the word, as it says in Acts 8 and verse 4, Paul and Barnabas continued to preach the gospel in these new cities. Now let's look at verse 8. At Lystra, a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke who, when he had fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he leaped up and began to walk. When the crowds saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice, saying in the Lyconian language, The gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you, 
and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways, and yet he did not leave himself without witness, in that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even saying these things, with difficulty they restrained the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, And having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. But while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. The next day, he went away with Barnabas to Derbe. So Paul's preaching in Lystra began a little differently than it had in the other cities on this trip. In The previous cities, he began in a synagogue with a Jewish audience who would have already had a background in the writings of the Old Testament. However, there's no mention of a synagogue here where Paul was teaching. But Paul was preaching here, and there was a man listening to him who was lame from birth. And Paul noticed him, and he could see that he had faith to be made well. Now, we know from Paul's letter to the Romans that faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ, as it says in Romans 10 and verse 17. So this man evidently believed Paul's message and knew that he could be healed by the power of God. So Paul looked at him and with a loud voice told him to stand up and immediately he leaped up and began to walk. Now, the crowds recognized this as a miracle, but they had a terrible misconception about what was happening. The crowd began to say in their native language that the gods have become like men and have come down to us. And while they were obviously wrong, it's not difficult to understand how they would have reacted this way given their background and what they believed. They had not yet been convinced of the error of their religious misconceptions and of the truth of the gospel of Christ. So with this misconception with their religious background, they concluded Barnabas must be Zeus, and Paul, since he was the chief speaker, was Hermes, the spokesman for the gods. The temple of Zeus, it says, was just outside the city, so the priest of Zeus came with oxen and garlands in order to offer sacrifices. Now, when Paul and Barnabas saw what was happening, they tore their robes, which was traditionally a sign of distress and mourning, and they rushed out to try to stop them. They explained to the people of Lystra that they were men of the same nature as they were, as these people were. And their message to them was to turn from these feigned things to serve the living God who made the heaven and the earth and sea and all that is in them. In other words, the goal of their message was to lead them out of pagan idolatry in order to follow and serve the only true and living God. They then explained that even though God chose the Jewish nation as his chosen people and gave his law to them, in essence, allowing all the other nations to go their own ways, God continued to provide evidence for his existence and power and care for them, for all of these other nations, through his ongoing providence by giving them rains from heaven and fruitful seasons. Yet even with this impassioned plea, They had difficulty restraining the crowds from offering sacrifices to them. Now, before we move on, we should notice briefly how Paul and Barnabas were identified back in verse 14. Both men were referred to as apostles. Of course, only Paul was an apostle of Christ, as we generally think of that term, not Barnabas. Yet there was a sense in which Barnabas was also an apostle. We need to understand what the word, the Greek word that's translated apostle, what that means. It means one who is sent. And both Paul and Barnabas were sent by the church in Antioch on this preaching tour, as is mentioned in Acts 13 and verse 3. So Paul was commissioned as an apostle of Christ, yet for this trip, Both men were commissioned and sent by the church in Antioch. 
Now, after all of this had happened, a group of Jews from Antioch of Pisidia and Iconium came to Lystra. These individuals had caused trouble for Paul in those cities, as we studied already, and now they'd followed him here to Lystra. And when they got here, they won over the crowds and stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, injuring him badly enough that they thought he was dead. Fortunately, Paul did not meet an untimely death here in the same way that Stephen did in Jerusalem back in Acts chapter 7. So when the disciples gathered around him, he eventually was able to stand on his feet after suffering this brutal attempt on his life. But instead of fleeing to some other place, he returned to the city, showing his courage and a refusal to be intimidated. Again, as we mentioned earlier, Paul was no coward. He went back to the city, even though he was nearly killed in the city. Then on the next day, he and Barnabas left Lystra in order to go east to Derbe. So we continue in verse 21. After they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. When they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. They passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. When they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. From there they sailed to Antioch, from which they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had accomplished. When they had arrived and gathered the church together, they began to report all things that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they spent a long time with the disciples. We're not given many details about Paul's preaching efforts in Derby. There's no mention of any opposition, perhaps since his opponents who stoned him in Lystra believed he was dead, so he was able to preach unnoticed by his enemies at this time. All we know is that Paul and Barnabas helped to make many disciples here in Derby before returning back through the cities they visited previously, Lystra and Iconium and Antioch of Pisidia. And as they traveled through these areas, they strengthened the disciples and encouraged them in the faith. They also warned them about tribulations they would have to face in order to enter the kingdom of God. Now, in that verse, the kingdom of God is not referring to the church. These disciples were already in the church. Instead, this is referring to the eternal reward of heaven in which we will be in the presence of God. This is the hope of every Christian. But Paul told these brethren that they would have to experience hardships for their faith before reaching that reward. And they had already seen Paul endure certain hardships firsthand. So Paul and Barnabas then appointed elders for them in every church. The role of elders is to oversee a local congregation. When Paul will meet with the elders from the church at Ephesus in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, he will tell them to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood, that they were made overseers over the church. And Peter, in his first epistle in chapter 5 and verse 2, told the elders to shepherd the flock of God among you. So this is the role of elders in the local church, to shepherd the flock, to oversee the congregation, Now, the fact that elders were able to be appointed so quickly after these churches were established can only be attributed to the fact that miraculous gifts of the Spirit were imparted to them. These are mentioned in Acts chapter 8 when Peter and John went to Samaria after Philip preached the gospel there. These gifts would be imparted so that they would be able to be established in the faith, as Romans 1 and verse 11 says. So these elders would oversee and guide these congregations in the absence of apostles like Paul working among them. So after they finished retracing their course from Antioch, they returned to the church that originally sent them on this first preaching tour. And once they arrived, they met with the church and began to report all that had been done, all that God had done with them and how he opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. 
Not only would this report be a matter of interest and a source of encouragement to the brethren in Antioch, it would also be an appropriate act of transparency and accountability since the congregation provided the resources necessary for them to travel and engage in this work. We talked about this back in the beginning part of Acts chapter 13. So even though Paul and Barnabas were the ones actively involved in preaching in these various places, the members of the church in Antioch were, as John would describe in 3 John verse 8, fellow workers with the truth through the support that they provided. So after completing their first missionary journey, as many people often call it, Paul and Barnabas spent a long time here with the disciples in Antioch. Unfortunately, trouble would eventually find its way to this church. And in dealing with that trouble, Paul and Barnabas would have to make a trip to Jerusalem in order to address the issue and the brethren who were involved. We will read more about that in the next chapter.